Well, I am pumped about this subject matter today because this is really the practical application uh, for completing the marriage project. We talked about that last weekend. Now, if you're single, this will put you miles ahead of the game if you can wrap your head around this simple truth. So don't clock out on me. I mean, don't, don't think, oh, well, this is not applicable to me. You know, this principle applies to all male and female relationships. I'm going to tell you, this will so put you ahead if you can understand this. It'll help you better understand your own wiring. It's the one thing that literally can make or break a marriage. It, in fact, just getting this one thing right could resolve unbelievable tension in your home. Because this is probably the biggest area of misunderstanding in families. This is the thing that Debbie and I have probably struggled with the most over 39 years of marriage. Just this understanding. It sounds like this. The husband says, my wife makes me feel like Rodney Dangerfield. The, the woman gives me no respect. I mean, no respect. Not even an ounce. The wife says, my husband never tells me he loves me. He never tells me much of anything. What's wrong with this man? And his response is, why in the world would I be slaving like a dog if I didn't love her? And she says, well, how can I respect the man who treats me like this? And that's, that's the essence of it. That's the problem in a nutshell. And the book I mentioned last week lays out a very simple plan for unraveling the craziness. It's called Love and Respect. And it's written by a guy that you're about to see here in a minute. We're going to have some clips of him uh, talking. But we'll, we'll let Jesus set up this with a quest, question he asked the first century crowd here in Matthew 19, 4. He says, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? Everybody knew he was referring to Genesis 1 there. He's saying, guys, stop and think about the male-female thing because it's crucial. This is a fundamental component that God wired into marriage, and you've got to understand it. You've got to understand the uniqueness of who you are, all right? And I know how complex this is for our brains to, to really absorb, so I'm going to pray for us right now. I'm just going to ask God, God, would you come into this room and bring illumination? Would you bring aha moments, paradigm shifts, changes, in the way we think toward one another. Help us to really grasp the, the depth of this, uh, of what we're talking about today. Holy Spirit, it's in your light that we see light. Would you illumine us in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. Now, you're about to see a guy named Emerson Egriches. <laughs> Is that for a name? And he's teaching from his book, Love and Respect. Here we go. And that right there is the continental divide between the sexes. There's a grand canyon of difference between us. Pink's not wrong for not being blue, and blue is not wrong for not being pink. They're just different, and we're talking way different. It's like we're communicating in code where everything comes across encrypted. When a wife says, you know, I, want you just, I just want you to be vulnerable, it's so clear and simple in her mind, what she's saying, that she's only, she's only telling him, I want you to be open with, him, with me. D to him, vulnerable means playing football without a helmet. You know, <laughs> are you crazy, woman? I mean, can you see the problem? It's like we, we really are from totally different planets. Let me tell you the true story of a guy who hardly ever remembered his anniversary, but somehow this time he managed he uh, stopped by Hallmark on the way home to find a card for his darling wife, and with all those racks of, you know, cards that were so confusing, he found one really colorful one jumped out at him. And just for the record, this is not me, all right? Okay. So he's looking for an anniversary card. Hold that in your head. He skimmed the words on the card, and they were perfect, so he grabbed it and hurried home rejoicing. She was thrilled, opened it immediately, and as she read those sweet words, her face turned to stone. He couldn't believe it. You know, what's wrong now? Nothing. Yes, there is. What's wrong? There's nothing wrong. Come on, I can see there is. What is it? Oh, it's not bad for a birthday card. She's furious. He's bewildered. He meant so well. You know, it's an honest mistake. Come on, give me a break. There are a lot of racks and cards. 
And she says, look, if you took your car in to be detailed and they put a stripe on the side of that car that was a fraction of an inch off, you would notice that, but you don't care anything about our anniversary or me. She shuts down, he stomps off, and that's how they celebrated their 10th anniversary at opposite ends of the house. So what happened? Well, this was the last straw. He doesn't even love her enough to take the time to read a card. And she's sending him that angry message in pink code, which, of course, he can't decipher. <laughs> All he sees through his blue glasses is a lot of disrespect, and that makes him feel guilty and irritated. I mean, come on, he meant well. It's crazy, but you do realize the card's not the issue. No, the real issue is that she felt unloved and responded the only way she knew how, by getting in his face and telling him off. She just wanted him to be genuinely sorry and not defensive so that they, they could get through it. They could work through it and go out for a nice dinner together. But the blue blurred all that. You know, his, his real issue is he's, he feels totally disrespected, so he'd show her. And here's what's sad. These two people didn't mean to hurt each other. They genuinely love each other, but they still end up hurt and angry, wondering how in the world the stupid thing ever happened. And they don't figure out what's going on, going on because each one blames the other for the whole sorry mess. Now, 39 years of marriage, I've been down this track too many times. It's, it's these kinds of goofy little conflicts that Solomon refers to in Song of Songs chapter 2, verse 15, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. Edgar just says he didn't figure it out until one day 20 years ago, he came across a particular verse in the Bible and suddenly the light bulb came on. It was his aha moment uh, where he finally saw why his wife could be crushed by his words and actions and why she could say things that just sent him through the roof. And I wanna tell you, I, this, this has been the same for me. This book really has changed the whole way I look at our marriage. I mean, it, it's, it's that, eye-opening. And this is the verse. It's Ephesians 5.33. So we got it on the screen. Let's read it out loud together. All right, ready? Each one of you must love his own wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, Paul is clearly saying here that wives need love and husbands need respect. These are the key ingredients in creating a happy marriage. But they also apply to any relationship between men and women because it's this is a male-female thing, really, not, not just a husband-wife thing. Now, I know women all across the auditorium are going, wait, wait a minute, Buster. Haven't you ever heard Aretha Franklin sing R-E-S-P-E-C-T? <laughs> Find out what it means to me, you know. I need respect, too. Come on. All right, but you, did you know that a man wrote that song to his wife? She did not write that song. A man by the name of Otis Redding wrote that song to his wife. Didn't get much tension until two years later when it was rewritten for Aretha and it became the feminist anthem for the 60s. I mean, one song, guys. We had one song. <laughs> and they took it away. <laughs> the point here is the proportions differ. Men obviously need love and men, women obviously need respect, but the primary drive in each sex is different. I mean, this goes all the way down to our toes. Dip, just as significant as love is to a woman, that's how deeply a man values and needs respect. Now, you know, really, what we'll be doing here, me and him together, is trying to convince you of that because there's nothing inside you that says this is true. I mean, all your wiring is saying, no, 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 no. People don't think that way. All right, let's say you were presented with this scenario. You have to choose one of the following. Which would you prefer to endure? You have to pick one, all right? To be left alone and unloved in the world or to feel inadequate and disrespected by everyone? No other options. You gotta pick one or the other. Shanti Feldhahn uh, is a social researcher who actually did a study on how men responded to that question. Now, they didn't ask women, but Get this, almost 80% of the men preferred being alone and unloved over feeling inadequate and disrespected by everyone. That's three out of four. 
three out of four guys. And most guys sitting here today are going, well, of course. You know, of course. Absolutely. And most of your wives are going, who are you? Are you kidding me? No, we're not. And you also need to hear me say, it's not that men don't need to be loved. It's just that we need respect more. Feldhahn sold more than two, copies of, uh, two million copies of that book, explaining why. In an interview, she was asked, what is the number one thing women need to know about men and men need to know about women that they do not understand? She said, by far, the most important thing that women need to know is that men look super confident, like I'm all that, and they're not. Of course, all the guys here would say, well, I am kind of all that, you know. But seriously, I mean, you know, she says, we have very different sets of insecurities as men and women. For most women, the cry of the heart is, am I lovable? Am I beautiful? Am I special? Am I worthy of being loved for who I am? I need to know that he loves me, that he cherishes me. Women don't realize that for men, it's 100% different. A man's inner cry isn't, am I lovable? It's, am I able? Am I adequate? Am I good at what I do? There's so much self-doubt under the surface that can't be seen. She said, women have no idea that it's there, that it's like a raw nerve they can hit. They can say, I love you all day long, but what a man needs and is most touched by is appreciation and respect, that she trusts him, that she believes in him and admires him. All of that is way more important to the average guy than if she loves him. And that's just (laughs) really, what? But it's true. Think of it this way. We all need food and water to survive, right? But we can live longer without food than we can without water. Doctors say we can go up to eight weeks, 50 plus days without food if we're healthy. But as long as as we're hydrated, as long as we're having water, but try to make it without water, you might last five days. For men, love's like food. And respect is is like water. And typically, not 100% of the time, women need love like men need respect. Egregious says, picture the wife having an air hose that goes to a love tank. I love this. When her husband bounds in and starts prancing around like a 10-point buck looking for some place to graze, he steps on her air hose. If she can find a baseball bat, she might just whack the big buck and say, get off my air hose, I can't breathe. Simply put, When her deepest need is being stepped on, you can expect her to react negatively. She looks visibly deflated. She's saying, I feel so unloved right now. I can't believe how unloving this feels. I can't believe you're doing this to me. Now, the guy's tank is marked respect. So when his lovely doe of a wife starts tromping on his air hose with her sharp, pointy little hooves, he's going, what is wrong with this woman? Well, the doofus gave her a birthday card for their anniversary. That's what's, that's what's wrong, and the battle is on. And Egregious calls this the crazy cycle. Without love, she reacts without respect. Without respect, he reacts without love, and around and around it goes, and where it stops, nobody knows. So here's what this looks like. Let's watch this. Oh, man, is that not true? I want you to see something in Ephesians 5.33. The, the Greek word that Paul uses for love here is agape, which means unconditional love. Now, here's what's interesting. Only husbands are commanded to agape love their wives. The wife is not commanded to agape love her husband. There are three different Greek words for love in marriage, and they mean different things. There's agape love, which is unconditional love. There's phileo love, which is friendship. And there's eros, love, which is erotic and and physical. In Titus 2, the older women are told to encourage the younger women to love their husbands and to love their children. But the word is phileo. It's it's, uh, phileo your children and your husband. Not fillet your husband. (laughs) It's the best friend kind of love that's affectionate and generous. Now, here's more of Egerges on why God commands husbands to love their wives unconditionally, and why wives are commanded to respect their husbands unconditionally. Let's watch. I think most of us would agree that our culture is not in a good place right now, and we are being influenced in ways we don't even understand. But here's what's different about us. 
about us sitting here. As believers in Christ, we are committed to view all of life through Christ-centered glasses. We're holding on to the Bible as the last word on everything, including our relationships. Last week, we looked at the big three reasons in the Bible for marriage. And besides needing help and raising kids to glorify God, this one is huge. Marriage is meant, our marriages are meant to display the permanence of God's commitment to us. Day in and day out, when we live out our vows to each other, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, willing to deny ourselves to love and respect each other, that is like this massive LED billboard pointing to the mercy and goodness of our maker. When we forgive and are patient and kind, as weak and imperfect as we are, when we try again and again, we reflect the faithfulness of God to the people in our world who don't yet know it. And that's what we're here for. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are a city set on a hill. He told us, let your light shine in the darkness of the culture. He said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He promised us in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you or forsake you. He never gives up on us. And he gives us the power of his spirit to do the same for one another. In so many ways, marriage is preparing us for eternity. Little wonder it's under such vicious attack in the culture right now. For one man to be married to one woman, faithful for life, has become countercultural in my lifetime. That's breathtaking. So what do you do if your spouse wants nothing to do with God and doesn't come close to agape loving you unconditionally? First Peter 3.1 has an answer. He says, if any husbands are disobedient to God's word, if they're not loving you unconditionally, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your faithful and what kind of behavior? Respectful <laughs> behavior. These husbands are rebelling against God, so Peter's point here is they don't deserve respect, but give, him to it, give, give it to them anyway, unconditionally. The Bible teaches unconditional respect across the board. Look at this, 1 Peter 2, 17. Show proper respect to everyone, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Now, that is totally counterintuitive. It's unnatural. It's unfair. And the only way we can pull this off is to stay plugged into God because God is very much into helping wives who choose to respect their undeserving husbands. Somehow he works through that like nothing else to melt men's heart toward their, their, their spouse, toward their wives, and toward him as well. And if you're thinking, yeah, that's right, that sounds like a bunch of archaic good old boy chauvinism if you ask me, I mean, then you need to know this didn't come out of thin air. I mean, this is not just a verse in the Bible. Current research actually confirms everything I'm saying. The University of Washington spent 20 years studying 2,000 couples married 20 to 40 years to the same partner. So 20 years they've been at this. Listen to this. They found two key ingredients are always present in those marriages that go the distance. Want to guess what they are? Love and respect. For a marriage to make it, in spite of what Paul calls the many troubles in this life, there has to be in the marriage love and respect in the relationship. All right, let's watch Emerson again. I'm telling you, God is at work here today because I, I believe some lights are coming on. Research has also found another factor in successful relationships that's extremely significant. Evidence shows that the most important predictor of satisfaction and stability in a marriage is kindness. It's what makes each partner feel cared for and understood, and it's how we get off the crazy cycle. And I'll be talking about that next week. I read a book that has convicted me to my toenails. I mean, it is just, it's Shanti Feldhahn that uh, I mentioned. All right, so the obvious question is, who goes first? Who makes the first move? Because I know you got to be wondering that, right? Let me just put it out there, all right? The one who goes first is the one who's most mature. And I know where that leads. <laughs> okay, so what if it doesn't work, smart guy? I mean, you know, what, let's say I put myself out there and they take advantage of me. 1 Peter 3, 6 says, wives, do what's right anyway. 
don't give way to fear. Eggridge uh, challenges wives to try the respect test. He says, think of some things that you respect about your husband, and when he's not busy or distracted, say, you know, I was thinking about you today, and I, several things that I really respect about you, and I just want you to know I, I do respect you. And uh, don't wait for a response. Just mention it and start to leave the room and see what happens. <laughs> One woman said, as she turned to leave, her husband practically screamed, wait, 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 come back, what things? <laughs> and because she was ready, and that's another, you know, important part of this, she could tell him exactly what things. After she was done, he said, wow, hey, can I take the family out to dinner? And this is a guy who never took the family out to dinner. The kids had stuff going on that night, so she got a rain check. A little later, the guy is in the kitchen fixing dinner, and he never fixed dinner. A few days later, he was doing the laundry. She's thinking, I might get a cruise out of this. Who knows, you know? <laughs> Honestly, I'm telling you gals, you have no idea. I'm, from the bottom of my heart, I'm saying this. You have no idea the power of this need in your guy. I mean, it, this is part of a male psyche. It's embedded in us and in, in who we are. Look at this next verse, 1 Peter 3, 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. If you don't treat her as you should, your prayers will not be heard. Be agreeable, be sympathetic, be loving, be compassionate, be humble. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty serious. I mean, that says if we're not seeing results on our prayer list, it might, this might be the problem. God says, work on the relationship, and I'll start answering some of those prayers you've been praying. Now, I'm just going to hit it again. I highly recommend this book. It's called Love and Respect, Emerson Egrich's. You know, uh, you've got it there in your bulletin notes. Uh, there's a survey in the appendix that will tell you how you're each doing on the love and respect quotient, as well as some things that you can say to get it out in the open, because that's the hard thing, isn't it? It's like, how do you talk about this without, you are not respecting me, you know, that kind of stuff. So th he suggests, you know, as a husband, you say, I'm feeling disrespected right now. Am I coming across unloving or vice versa? And we're offering the class again. Because a lot of people were asking last night and this morning, you know, where do I go from here? We're offering this class. It starts May 14th. That's next Sunday, right? Isn't May 14th next? Today, today's seventh, right? Seven. Okay. That's next Sunday. And uh, 10.50 to 12.15, and, and you'll get to go through the entire video series. This thing is powerful, and uh, it is so worth the effort, because this, you know, the thing is, guys, this is all going to go away. This is a blip on the screen. You'll forget all about this if you don't intentionally focus on it, because it's not in the way you think. You're never going to see her this way unless you focus on it. You're never going to see him this way unless you focus on it. This is a reality. This is a bottom line reality and a difference in the way we're wired. And there is no way we are going to be able to lock into something this foreign to our human nature without God first opening our eyes to it. And that's where this begins. It really, the whole process starts with a prayer of surrender. It, it's, God, I cannot do this on my own. I cannot see this. I can't get it right without you because only your Holy Spirit can help us to take down the walls, because I'm telling you, the longer you're married, the more you, walls start to come up. You just, you just, you know, I can't take it, you know, and because you're not understanding where things are coming from. So only the Holy Spirit can help us take down the walls and open up to each other. So that's where we're going to go, all right? We're, I want you to stand with me. We're going to pray. Heavenly Father, I'm asking you, would you just, by your Holy Spirit, enter this room, I know the frustration that so many people are feeling right here today. Only you can heal all the hurt and damage that's been done. Only you can cool the anger that has built up over time. I'm asking you, open the eyes of our hearts to each other. Help us, Lord. Give us an epiphany of where, we're, where our spouse is coming from that this is not just made up. Open new lines of communication and understanding. We're trusting you to do what we cannot do, God. We're asking you to heal wounds today,
to come into this. You, you promised to bind up broken hearts, and I'm asking you to do that today and to restore communication and love and respect in marriages here. Help us to forgive each other and recommit to the vows that we make. Lord, would you just come? Would you heal us? Would you help us?